Welcome everyone to Silver Screen Slam, where we praise those wonderful moving pictures we have all enjoyed over the past century. I am your mediocre host, Jake Brown, here to guide you through the underbrush of bland, impermanent films to show you gorgeous works of art you may have not realized existed. So come join me each episode as we explore movies of the past and present and discuss our conflicting feelings about them and how that compares with what our loyal viewers have to say. After each episode, we will ask you to voice your own opinion about upcoming movies we delve into via our social media outlets at the bottom of your screen. With that being said, let's begin. During each episode, we'll discuss a movie that we feel has earned considerable praise for bringing many positive artistic elements to the screen. This may be a new release, a not-so-new release, or even one of the classics. In our previous episode, we explored 1999's eye-opening look at the modern middle class, American Beauty, declaring it a profound piece of storytelling with its opposing messages and the precise near-perfect layering of these messages. In this episode, we'll explore a tale about the simultaneous reverence and revulsion of one of history's greatest artistic minds, the 1984 Mozart music masterpiece, Amadeus, directed by Milos Forman. But before we try to speak for all mediocrities in the world, let's first talk some extras. Movies really are wondrous things. They allow creative minds to present stories and ideas in either a very controlled or very chaotic style, all within the margins of a clean, rectangular canvas. There's just so much one can pack into a film. To reference an inspirational artist of ours, they're the sum total of every expressive medium of all time. But movies also have a type of cover art they use to advertise themselves outside of the normal movie poster. And we know this as the movie preview, or more famously, movie trailer. With a film trailer, a movie maker has the ability to create a one to three minute compact representation of their piece. In a very real sense, movie trailers are their own works of art. But the movie maker has to be careful not to misrepresent their work through their trailer. And this is a very thin straight to cross, as there have been many who have drowned in the maelstrom of not doing their final work justice, and others who have been chomped up by their audiences for overhyping an inferior final piece. Sometimes a misleading movie trailer is the fault of the director, but most times it's the producers of a film that is the financial backers who are the culprits, as they can be separate from the writer and director and tend to have a different, more monetary agenda with their marketing megaphone. Take a look at a great film by one of my personal favorite directors, Quentin Tarantino's 2009 stylized World War II tale, Inglorious Bastards. In the film, a team of American vigilantes, with their leader played by the famous Brad Pitt, make it their mission to sneak through Nazi-occupied France and kill as many of the National Socialists as they possibly can. It's a great story and well written and executed by Tarantino and the actors respectively. But taking a look at the film's trailers, Brad Pitt and crew are almost all that's shown, causing a very important plot within the movie to be missed. That being the dramatic arc of the wonderful, albeit less recognizable, character Shoshana and her own unforgettable fight against the Nazis. The way in which this was all presented caused me to be completely thrown off when finally watching the film for the first time. However, it should be noted that I have since revisited the film again and again, and again, and now after so many viewings, I think it's safe to call it Molto Buona. But there are other examples of the opposite effect as well, such as Zack Snyder's 2006 adaptation of the history-inspired Frank Miller Spartan Tale 300, which saw a trailer that hyped the film up a little more than it deserved. Not only this, but many times a movie trailer can simply give away too much of a story, causing the viewer to lose interest altogether. Once again, a trailer really is its own separate piece. Therefore, maybe it's best that we view it more like one, instead of allowing it to hold quite as strong of an influence on us with what it represents. By doing so, we may end up having more of an appreciation of the final film. You know, all this talk of artistic representation reminds me of... Oh wait, wrong camera. Our featured flick of the episode. One of confidential, disgusting events and unconfessed crimes of buried wickedness. Amadeus. Or at least that's what the trailer claims. 1984's look at creative contempt gone unchecked was directed by Milos Forman and starred F. Murray Abraham and Tom Hulse. 
Amadeus was based on the 1979 highly fictionalized Peter Schaeffer play of the same name and begins in the early 19th century. It centers on long-forgotten Italian composer Antonio Salieri, played by Abraham, as he is placed in an asylum following a recent suicide attempt, coupled with screams of a confession. That confession? The murder of a composer who needs no introduction, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. One day soon after the suicide attempt, Salieri is greeted by a young priest willing to hear his confession, at which point the viewer is thrown back decades in time to a more youthful, very musically gifted Salieri and his fateful introduction to the even younger, more talented Mozart, played by Holtz. As the story progresses, Salieri recounts his childhood love for music and his loyalty to God, and how as he grew older, these loves were only enhanced and strengthened. Enter Mozart. Now, Salieri had heard of Amadeus all his life and had immense reverence for the prodigious musician. But upon witnessing this lewd and disrespectful fiend in person for the first time, Salieri is almost immediately split in two. One side of him adores every note produced by the Salzburgian sensation, while the other despises the man behind the music and wonders how God could have ever endowed this abomination with such a magical gift. How God could choose Mozart over Salieri, who himself has shown unwavering commitment to the Catholic deity. This internal conflict only amplifies further, building and building inside Salieri until he can take no more. Let's take a look at a clip from the trailer. Tell us about Wolfgang. Amadeus. Mozart. Mozart. Mozart? <laughs> How good is he, this Mozart? He's remarkable. He's an unprincipled, spoiled, conceited brat. I'm a vulgar man. But I assure you, my music is not. He burns with fire. He is an angel. He is a devil. He claimed he'd been poisoned. Some said he accused a man. Some said the man was Salieri. Salieri? Salieri. I don't believe it. All the same. Could it be possible? Did Salieri do it after all? Did he murder Amadeus? From this well-constructed preview, we get what I feel is one of the best possible representations of what we, the audience, are about to see. The trailer explains so much, yet divulges so little. It tells you enough of what you're about to witness, yet still keeps many of the juicy details vague. And there's hardly any in-film audio in it either, mainly just the independent narration not found in the final film that grabs hold of the viewer's curiosity and pulls it closer and closer with each new word. This classic styling for a film about a not-so-classic tale leaves us considering it more of an exception to the previously mentioned trailer rule, if we can say so at this point. Now, as for the film itself, there are many great qualities to it. Director Foreman and original playwright Schaefer teamed up for months putting together the best possible adaptation of Schaefer's original play, that by the time they were finished, they had an entirely new work of art on their hands. They filmed on location in Foreman's home of Prague, Czechoslovakia, as well as Vienna, Austria, where the story takes place. One fun fact about the film is that the in-movie sequences of Mozart's Don Giovanni were actually performed on the stage of what is now known as the Estates Theatre in Prague, the very same stage as Don Giovanni's first historical performance two centuries prior. <laughs> in addition to the sets, Foreman and company took great care in creating the beautiful costumes and other visuals as well. Did you know that every scene in the film was lit naturally, with no artificial lighting used whatsoever? I asked you a question. Well, now you know. But I personally feel that these attributes, as praiseworthy as they clearly are, shine only so bright when compared to one aspect of the film that has always stood out to me above all others. And that is the... No, 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 no. Not that. Not that. That is the breathtaking, absolutely incomparable performance of F. Murray Abraham as Antonio Salieri. In this film, Abraham takes us not just through the story of one person, but through it as three completely distinct characters wrapped into one. The way in which he executes the young Salieri's dueling emotions right in front of the camera, one so wrapped up in the warm reverence of another artist's true genius, yet the other filled with hatred towards such talent's embodiment, simply cannot be topped. Oh wait, that's right, it is topped. By Abraham. Because he also plays he also plays the old guy. Old Salieri. Three of the And the way in which Schaefer writes Salieri, coupled with Abraham's performance, brings us a character who is so unique. This is a man who is not the best at what he does. He may be perceived as such during his time, but his type of talent only lasts so long and eventually fades. And he knows this. 
He may be only so good, but it's the true genius that Salieri can see in Mozart that punches through the screen with such force. Genius that few others are able to recognize throughout Mozart's life the way Salieri can. And this jaw-dropping trio of characters that Abraham presents has yet to be matched by any other actor, in my personal opinion. And if you'd like to challenge me on that, I challenge you to challenge me. It's a challenge. So, that's a lot of good, right? But what about the bad? What? I've talked about all the good aspects of this fi- Oh, that's right! The music! Now, as difficult as this may be to accept, I am not the musical mastermind I play on screen. Therefore, I can only say so much about the score to this film. It was based entirely off of the classical music of the story's era, namely that of Mozart and Salieri. It was very pleasant to hear and complimented each scene wonderfully. But I think it's best to let the writing of Peter Schaefer express to our viewers the absolute perfection of this film's musical score, vocalized through the once again brilliantly portrayed character of Salieri. Let's watch. On the page, it looked nothing. The beginning simple. Almost comic. Just a pulse. Bassoons. Basset horns. Like a rusty squeeze box. <laughs> and then, suddenly, high above it, an oboe. A single note hanging there, unwavering. until a clarinet took it over. Sweetened it into a phrase of such delight. And the fluid layout of the film score in the background by conductor and music supervisor Sir Neville Mariner is so harmonious that it actually acts as its own character. Are we okay to move to the bad now? No. Okay then, I guess let's hear what the public has to say. And since our last episode, we had another comment from Twitter user AnthonyC11749, and it reads, you never have anything bad about your movies on this crap show. Are you going to talk about the terrible accents in Amadeus? Well, Anthony, I used to think something like that was a big deal. But if you have an entire cast with phenomenal talent, which can certainly be said for Amadeus, in my opinion, their accents can be overlooked. However, you do still make a good point, and I remain on the fence about it in general. Because what makes a good actor is the ability to go outside one's comfort zone. So, thank you for your input. Wah. It's difficult to think of a movie that compares to Amadeus, because Amadeus feels so one-of-a-kind with its story and characters. However, after much thought, we've considered a film whose central character shares a recognition and appreciation of talent that's beyond him. And that film is the 2011 art nostalgia tale Midnight in Paris, written and directed by Woody Allen and starring Owen Wilson and Rachel McAdams. Midnight in Paris tells the story of a man named Gil, a writer who is visiting his fiancée's family in Paris, France. Gil is unhappy with his current work in Hollywood and longs to be back in turn-of-the-century Paris when the heart and soul of the literature he loves flooded its streets with their company. His fiancée, Inez, clearly doesn't share his sentiments, showing constant annoyance with Gil and eagerness to get back to the States. But it's when Gil wanders off from a party of hers one night at midnight that he is approached by a taxi cab from the 1920s and taken on a literal time-traveling journey through this great city. While doing so, he meets the notable names he's always adored, such as F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, and Salvador Dali. Gil also meets the welcoming presence of a beautiful young woman who has shown much interest in him and his work. Will he choose to stay in the early 20th century with his exciting new companions, or go back to the half-fulfilled life he once had in the 21st? The world may never know. Except for me. I know what happens. I've seen the movie. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of Silver Screen Slam. Join us next episode when we'll change things up a bit by sitting down with some special guests and exploring the 1982 embodiment of the sci-fi genre itself, Blade Runner.
directed by Ridley Scott and starring Harrison Ford and Rudger Hauer. If you have anything you'd like to voice about next episode's film, or if you enjoy this show in general, feel free to drop us a line on our social media outlets at the bottom of your screen. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jake Brown, and, well, there it is. Instead of allowing it to hold quite as sharp, but poo pa pa. Damn it. <clears throat> That's it. That's where it is. Wait, where is Brad Pitt? He's right here, isn't he? That's weird.